changing much. So we've uh, started with the reading of the chapter, Making of a Scientist. And uh, let us uh, just uh, revise what we had discussed. This is the story of how a child, because of his circumstances, he you know, ended up becoming a scientist. It was not that he had this very deep desire to become one, but because of the situation that he was in, because of the environment he was in, he was provided with an environment where he would learn a lot. And that led him to becoming a scientist. And he was such a successful one that at the young age, when uh, in this uh, very reputed journal, when only senior scientists and reputed scientists could get their articles published, his article was published when he was a college student, right? And he gave a very important, uh, uh, you can say, story about or the theory about the cell division theory, right? And uh, yes, yeah, so as we know how important these theories are for the development of sciences and uh, how he started on this. So Ebright, as a child, he was alone. He didn't have much of a companionship and uh, he lost his father at an early age. So his mother, she tried to keep him busy. This when they were at home, they would spend a lot of time together and she would make him, you know, read a lot. And he also was there made to collect things. So when he would collect also, he would get an interest also. She would buy him microscopes and telescopes even. So he was there into, you know, like, yes, mounting materials, looking at them through the microscope. He would gaze at the stars through the telescope. But yes, what did he start doing? He started collecting butterflies and he was able to collect all the different kinds of species, the 25 kind of species, am I correct? Which were there in his, uh, you know, like a uh, city. And uh, after that, uh, yes, he found out or his mother, you know, got this book for him. That was the travels of Monarch X. Monarch is a kind of a butterfly. So he read that book, he went, you know, like, and at the end of that book, there were a series of activities that were suggested. So the writer of the book, the scientist, and he had suggested these activities and uh, Ibrahim, he, he participated in them. So they were asked to tag these butterflies, right? The monarch butterflies and report about their, you know, travels that how far they migrated. So he did that, but he was a little disappointed because he was not able to get so much of information back. In fact, Ibrahim went to the extent of having these butterflies in his basement in various stages of eggs and pupa and butterfly and all, and so that he could have a study of them at very close quarters. But then he realized that, see, this is not science. And that is what we are going to learn about. So what was that, you know, like if uh, that turning point in his life, when he realized that collecting information, you now you write down about this, this butterfly was found there, this is the color, and uh, this is, these are its migratory habits or whatever. You write about that, that is not exactly, you know, like what he thought was science. So collecting facts and information, it's very different. So now he is really going to start on his journey of becoming a scientist. So let's read and find out what happens next, okay? And please tell me if you are able to see the screen. Can you see the screen now? Yes. We, we, we did this also. Yeah, thank you, Dhruv. Right. So we did this also? Yes? The, that uh, chart, that, we have, that uh, diagram that we have? So, right. Now we will find out that when did he actually start, uh, with, you know, desiring to become a scientist? When did he come to know that what a scientist is supposed to do? Then in the seventh grade, he got a hint of what real science is when he entered a county science fair and lost. It was really a sad feeling to sit there and not get anything while everybody else had won something. So he participated in a fair, right? He got in a competition and all around him, everybody was getting a prize, but he did not get a prize, but he was not disappointed. His entry was slides of frog tissues, which he showed 
under a microscope. He realized that the winners had tried to do real experiments, not simply make a neat display. So it's just like that you're going for an exhibition and everybody has made working models and you go there with a chart. So it's very different, isn't it? So he realized displaying something, showing something is not science. So it was quite different from what he expected. And he was disappointed. Everybody got a prize. I didn't got a prize. What am I supposed to do? Already the competitive spirit that drives Richard E. Bright was appearing. This was one quality of his. He had a competitive spirit. Yes, I am going to fight for it. I knew that for the next year's fair, I would have to do a real experiment. And he's already preparing in advance. Ki next year, when the competition hoga, what am I going to do? Right? He said the subject I knew most about was the insect work I'd been doing in the past several years. So what did he know about? He knew about butterflies. And he thought, I'm going to do something on the butterflies only. So he wrote to Dr. Oquart for ideas and back came a stack of suggestions for experiments. So he wrote to Dr. Oquart. Who was Dr. Oquart? Who tell me? Who was he? So who was Dr. Oquart? Yes? Anybody give me the answer, please? So look back, I'll show you now who is Dr. Oquart. So he was doing research on the butterflies, isn't it? And it was mentioned there at the end of the book that he did. That is the travel of the monarch X, isn't it? So he wrote to him and Dr. Ukwat gave him a series of lots of ideas. These are the things that you can do for your projects. You can do for your experiments. Those kept Ibrahim busy all through high school and through his schooling days, he was busy on all those experiments. And as a result, it led to prize projects in county and international science fairs. So he felt I'm comfortable working with what? The insect, which insect? The monarch butterfly. And so he's decided that I should do my all experiments also related to it, isn't it? Now for his eighth grade project, Ebright tried to find the cause of a viral disease that nearly kills nearly all monarch caterpillars every few years. So when you, you know, like you answer questions like what, when, why, how, right? All these questions here, right? You, you want to seek answers for them. That is a part of your, what, your scientific queries, you know? So he wanted to find out the cause of a viral disease that kills nearly all monarch caterpillars every few years. Ibrahim thought the disease might be carried by a beetle. So there might be some insect and that insect beetle must be spreading that disease. And that is why these monarch caterpillars, they die in such large numbers. He tried raising caterpillars in the presence of beetles. So beetles ke presence may, let's see what these beetles are going to do. Is it because of the beetles, the caterpillars are dying? I did not get any real results. Said, but I went ahead and showed, and I had tried the experiment. This time I won. He lost when he showed a slide of a frog tissue. And then he got a list from Dr. Oquart, a list of a series of projects that he could do. One was, what was it? That what kills the monarch caterpillars, right? Why every few years, so many monarch caterpillars die. He thought another insect is causing that disease, you know, it's killing them. So he raised those monarch uh, butterflies in the presence of beetles. Nothing happened. He showed this experiment. He got a prize. The next year, his science fair project was testing the theory that viceroy look, viceroys look like monarchs because monarchs don't taste good to birds. So the monarch butterflies is not very tasty, right? That's why birds maybe don't eat it. And they prefer the viceroy butterfly. Please remember this, all these uh, facts you will have to learn. This chapter is like that only. 
Viceroys, on the other hand, do taste good to birds. So more they look like monarchs, the less likely they are to become a bird's dinner. So now what is happening is that the viceroy butterflies, they've started looking like the monarch butterflies. They're trying to imitate or they are there trying to copy the monarch butterfly, okay? That means monarch butterflies are not killed as much by birds as the viceroy butterfly. Is it clear? E. Bright's project was to see whether, in fact, the birds would eat monarchs. He found that a starling would not eat ordinary bird food. It would eat all the monarchs it could get. Ibright, so the birds would eat monarchs. So a starling would not eat, a starling is a bird. Starling would not eat ordinary bird food. A starling was different. It would eat all the monarchs it could get. Ibright said later research by other people showed that viceroys probably do copy the monarch. This project was placed first in the zoology division and third overall in the county science fair. So in the eighth grade, he is thinking that, yes, so why is it, you know, that the viceroy is looking like the monarch? What was the reason? Because the monarch butterfly is not found tasty by the birds. So they're not eating it as much, right? So this was one of his projects. He got a prize for that also, see? And this is one insect, he's very comfortable. He's comfortable with the butterflies. He's collected them, he's known them. He knows about the migration and traveling patterns, okay? In his second year in high school, Richard Ebright began the research that led to his discovery of an unknown insect hormone. Indirectly, it also led to his new theory on the life of cells. Now, see a high school student, right? Someone of your age, he's working on this project that yes, about an unknown insect hormone. And uh, when he was working on it, he was also on his way of the finding the theory of the life of cells. The question he tried to answer was simple. What is the purpose of the 12 tiny gold spots on a monarch pupa? So the monarch butterfly also has spots. Let's look at the picture once again, does it? Yes, look at the monarch butterfly. Which is the monarch butterfly on the top? Does it have these spots and all? So the, it seems as if the pupa also has these spots, okay? Pupa, what is stage? Hai? Is, it, is it before the butterfly? So that pupa also has those spots on it. What is the purpose of that? Why is it such a decorative uh, pupa? What was it? Everyone assumed the spots were just ornamental. Ibright said, but Dr. Okwat didn't believe it. So, right, he said that, see here, everybody thought that these spots are ornamental. Ornamental decoration ke liye. Ye sundar dikhe ga, different dikhe pupa. But Dr. Okwat, what did he say? No, there must be a reason why are these spots over there. To find the answer, Ibright and another excellent science student first had to build a device that showed that the spots were producing a hormone necessary for the butterfly's full development. <coughs> Sorry. So first of all, they had to find that, see, these spots are producing a hormone for the development, right? They're not just ornamental. This project, Ibright, won a bright first place in the county fair and entry into the international science and engineering fair. So see, he's come such a long way from the first experiment that he did when he took that slide, right, tissues, a frog tissue for the competition. And now he's actually working on finding answer to so many questions, right? And see, at young age, now he's participating, he's eligible for participating in international competitions also. So what did he first do? 
first was that the viceroy butterfly copied the monarch butterfly yes later on it was proved second rather first it was that yes they uh, die you know like the death of the caterpillars the monarch caterpillars and he did that in the presence of beetles but nothing happened that mean beetles are not responsible for the death then what why does it happen what is there so then he did about this copying now he's doing about the spots on the pupa and the spots here they are not decorative they're not ornamental but it seems that they have a very important role to play they are there producing hormones which help in the change of the growth of the butterfly yes now this project won a bright first place in the county fair and entry into the international science and engineering fair there he won third prize for zoology he also got a chance to work during the summer at the entomology laboratory of the walter reed army institute of science so he got a chance during the summer he could participate you know take part or you can say do his research at the army institute of research which is a very big opportunity right so he's doing very well he's participating in international uh, competitions he's got a chance to work right to do his research at such a very good laboratory as a high school junior richard ebright continued his advanced experiments on the monarch pupa that year his project won first place at the international science fair and gave him another chance to work in the army laboratory during the summer so whenever he got a prize yes yeah, so he was moving one step forward and he was getting chances to work at the army laboratory fine okay in his senior year he went a step further he grew cells from a monarch wings in a culture and showed that the cells would divide and develop into normal butterfly wing scales only if they were fed the hormone from the gold spots so those spots which were there on the pupa they're not ornamental but they are very important for the growth so these wings you know he took the tissue culture from there made that culture and their cells would only divide that growth would be proper only if the hormones they came from those spots that project won first place for zoology at the international fair he spent the summer after graduation during further work at the army laboratory and at the laboratory of the us department of agriculture so he's getting chances the more prizes he is winning the more opportunity he is getting he is getting you know chance to work in very well equipped laboratories the following summer after his freshman year at harvard university now he's gone to university he's gone to harvard he's still carrying on with his studies he's still carrying on with his research ibright went back to the laboratory of the department of agriculture and did more work on the hormone from the gold spots using the laboratory's sophisticated instruments he was able to identify the hormone's chemical structure now because he was doing so well in zoology he was doing so well in his research he got this opportunity to work in the department of agriculture laboratory and that laboratory had very advanced equipments written advanced that he was able to identify the hormones chemical structure so right yes you've done about your compounds and all and how they have a structure isn't it right so the hormone there also having the structure and he was able to identify it. what an achievement a year and a half later during his junior year ibright got the idea for his new theory about cell life it came while he was looking at x ray photos of the chemical structure of a hormone so he had found the structure of the hormone how did he get more ideas see when you are there on the path of research one thing leads to another 
okay and maybe you might start from simple things and you go on into more complex and detailed things so he was studying the structure of that hormone looking at the x-ray of the hormone and he got an idea of what his cell theory right or about his theory about cell life so when he saw those photos ebright didn't shout eureka like archimedes did or even i've got it like maybe newton or anybody right but he believed that along with his findings about insect hormones the photo gave him the answer to one of biology's puzzles what is that how the cell can read the blueprint of its dna dna is the substance in the nucleus of a cell that controls heredity it determines the form and function of the cell thus dna is the blueprint for life so when he was looking through those photographs so he just found out that what is that substance what is that here in the cell that controls life right what makes the other cell what makes everything look so same right the cells here so there was one answer that he found that was dna d n a you might be knowing the full form of it you must have done it in your sciences so how is dna it controls heredity right what are genes look like what we look like dna is there controlling us it determines the form and function of the cell what and as we know in our body our organs and tissues you have done about the how we have different kinds of cells also performing different functions thus dna is the blueprint for life dna controls heredity dna controls the form and the function of the cell what kind of a cell it would be right and so dna is so important deoxyribonucleic acid very good dna uh, dna i'm saying very good answer yes so you all know that yeah your dna and rna isn't it and we have done the structure of it also maybe i hope so now just see it is here how old do you think he's just joined university okay and now he is on the path of a, a very very important discovery so it is not necessary you know sometimes that yeah i i have to be very old and mature to become a renowned scientist it is your qualities it is your determination how curious are you how patient are you how hard working are you right that is what makes you so different and if you don't get the desired results are you going to give up or are you going to start again this is one thing here we have to know that how much hard work the scientists have to put in they just can't give up so easily and if a scientist had given up so easily there would be so many things that we would not be aware of now so right so big clap and a big thank you to all the scientists who have been making so much efforts and it is because of their contribution because of their hard work that we are able to yes maybe further work further on those discoveries so ebright and his college roommate james r wong walked all that night drawing pictures and constructing plastic models of molecules to show how it could happen together they later wrote the paper that explained the theory now the cell life it works how the dna controls everything like dna is the mastermind it controls controls everything it controls heredity also it also controls that what is the cell going to do in the body what kind of a cell is it going to be right so see how important nothing uh, you know like uh, like it it is such an important uh, discovery surprising no one knew him who knew him richard ebright graduated from harvard with highest honors second in his class of uh, 1510 students Ebright went on to become a graduate student researcher at Harvard Medical School. 
there he began doing experiments to test his theory. So he's now, there was no surprise at all that he is a, such a brilliant student. He's such a hardworking student that he was bound to be there, okay? So he came second in his class and then he went on, yes, to Harvard Medical School. And there he carried on with his experiments and he wanted to test his theory, okay? Any doubts, any questions? Anyone? Yes, any questions, anybody? 